Ladies and gentlemen, former president of Iceland, Herr Ólaf Ragnar Grímsson, first of all, I would like to congratulate you and your team for this fabulous conference, for this uh, meeting, chance to, to network and meet with everyone who is interested in this important area, the Arctic region. And I have to say that I didn't think we could make it bigger and better than it has been, but I was proven wrong. So congratulations. And it gives me a great pleasure to address this plenary session here in, at the, at the uh, Arctic Circle seminar. This is organized by NORA, the North Atlantic Cooperation and, and Bellona. And we're focusing on the Arctic renewable energy networks and the various political, economic, environmental, and technical aspects to the energy systems of the North Atlantic countries. And before I enter into more detailed discussion on the energy systems in the North, possibilities of interconnections and so forth, I would just like to give a few words on the big picture of the Arctic and Iceland's position in that area. Over the course of time, just as we see with this, uh, with the conference and, and how it has grown, the Arctic, or the High North, as it is sometimes called, is occupying more and more prominent place on the agenda of international affairs, and with a good reason. The Arctic is a global crossroads between commercial and, and environmental interests. On the one hand, we have substantial natural resources within the region, and on the other hand, we have the perspective of the Arctic as being particularly pristine, pristine and vulnerable environment. We, for centuries, Iceland's economic and social well-being and livelihood has been shaped by the natural riches and climate conditions of the Arctic. Our interests in the Arctic are manifold and the government of Iceland has identified developments in the Arctic and Iceland's role in both managing and protecting it as one of our top priorities. Our Arctic policy direction has been pursued in various ways. Our policy encompasses 12 wide-ranging principles, including promoting and strengthening the Arctic Council as the premier forum for Arctic cooperation, and the importance of and respect for international law. The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea being the prime example. The policy states clearly that Iceland will adhere to principles of sustainability and the protection of the environment, which are regarded crucial when discussing the future of economic development. Regional cooperation with other stakeholders is of key importance. The Arctic Council remains the most important forum for discussion and decision-making on issues pertaining to the Arctic. Iceland will chair the body from 2019 to 2021, which gives us an important opportunity to put a stronger mark on the agenda as other countries have done during their chairmanship. Last month, the government of Iceland agreed and published a report on Iceland's interest in the Arctic, opportunities and challenges. The aim of the publication of this assessment is to chart out Iceland's principal interest in the complex environment of the Arctic. These include both the international, political, and economic opportunities that lie in the development of the Arctic region and the challenges that accompany them, particularly as regards to the environment. Thus, this assessment is intended as a contribution to the debate on this important range of issues. A special chapter in the assessment is on economic development and resource utilization in the field of energy and industry. The assessment of interest will be followed up with a preparation of a plan of action, and this is already underway. Ladies and gentlemen, we should always remember that the Arctic has, has historically been bountiful in renewable and non-renewable energy. And it is my belief that the Arctic should be a region that other countries look to when exploring energy and industry-related development. We here in Iceland speak from first-hand experience, as we have been fortunate enough to be able to utilize our energy sector in a sustainable manner 
for decades with a focus on geothermal energy and hydropower. Today, this industry is one of the main pillars of our economy and the main pillars of our everyday life. Innovation and new energy technologies play a key role in this respect as we gradually move towards a clean energy era. Our Icelandic energy policy has proven that it is both realistic and economically sensible, and more than that, economically necessary to pursue a clean energy agenda. I can mention one practical example. In Iceland, around 76% of final energy consumption is from renewable sources, and the remaining 24% is from fossil fuel used in transportation and the fisheries fleet. We know what the project is, how to get up to 100%. We know what the challenges are. We know where we need to focus our attention. And it's my vision that the politicians of today, that we can make as bold decisions and bold commitments for our future generations as the politicians 40 years ago or so made when decisions were made to, uh, during the oil, height of the oil crisis to switch off imported oil for house heating and go geothermal all the way. It wasn't easy, it wasn't without risk, and it was expensive, but there were decisions made that we are now reaping the benefits of my generation and the generations to come. And I think that we have now another chance of making similar important decisions by advancing in the remaining 24% that we have and make huge steps to be the first country in the world to go 100% uh, renewable in total energy consumption. That is my dream. Unfortunately, the term is coming to an end, but we have another term coming up. The, we have been able, gradually, to achieve this status through, again, innovation and sustainable utilization of our renewable resources in hydropower and geothermal energy. In the last 40 years, the share of fossil fuel in space heating has decreased from 50% down to uh, 1%. Today, around 99%, even more, 99 point something of our house heating is from renewable sources, 90% being from geothermal and the remaining from electricity um, from uh, renewable sources. We can almost knock on the doors of the houses and we know where they are. We're not going to eliminate the houses, but we are going to switch them to renewable energy, and that is our, our goal. And the social and economical benefits of this development have been enormous. And this, as I said before, would not have been able, it wouldn't have happened without political decision and commitment being made in the 70s to move towards utilization of domestic renewable energy sources. And this can also be the story of the Arctic. The burning of fossil fuel and timber for energy generation causes formation of soot or black carbon, which is particularly harmful as it increases the melting of the ice cap and threats, threatens human health in the Arctic communities. Ways of increasing the share of renewable energy in the Arctic should therefore be a priority in our work in the coming years. Did I do something? Yes. No. I thought you were looking at the, because I see something, but we have it here, and it's correct. Anyway, our focus, again, should be on innovation, research, and development. In this regard, I can mention uh, the good example, which my, the previous speaker mentioned as well, which is the North Atlantic Energy Network Project, which has been supported from NORA, and the Nordic Council of Ministers. The aim of the project is to investigate how isolated energy systems in the North Atlantic can be connected to Norway and Greenland to form an electrical grid in the North Atlantic. The project has explored the potential of connecting some of the best renewable energy sources in the Arctic and the North Atlantic, access 
and utilization of renewable energy is a key element in fighting global warming, and this project has allowed informative exchange of knowledge between the participating regions and organization. The NIAN project shows us that there are great possibilities within the Arctic of cooperation in increasing the share of renewable energy for the benefits of future generation, and this is something that I do believe that we can put more focus in in the coming years. I know I'm running out of time here, but just in, in uh, a few words on another interconnector, which I know that people are interested in hearing the status of, which is the, the possibility of an interconnector between the UK and Iceland. The status of that uh, project is, in very few words, uh, such that after extensive research on this matter, this uh, electoral term, we have uh, presented reports in front of the, for the parliament, and in following that, we submitted eight reports on different areas uh, regarding this issue, environmental assessment, economical imp economic impact studies, uh, influence on, on other energy and household, uh, industry and households. As the previous speaker mentioned, there are a lot of issues to be uh, explored. We have also had exploratory talks with the UK government, and in June last, I submitted all these uh, reports, uh, made them public, and they are now for everyone to, to look at. There will be no more decisions on this matter taken during this term, but we have at least uh, eliminated a lot of the uncertainty. We have answered a lot of questions. For example, that this project uh, cannot be, cannot be uh, is not economically viable without support from the UK. But as I said when I presented it, here, is the, here are the findings. Uh, now it's open for everyone to, to look at. There are indeed possibilities, and there are indeed questions that we have answered but there are also new questions that we need to answer. So thank you, thank you very much.